My dear friends, sisters and brothers, this, of course, is my final presidential address to you as the Dyson Synod, though not actually the last time I'm going to address you because I'm dealing with the last item today. It has been an enormous honour to serve as Bishop of this great and ancient diocese for the past nearly 10 years. But I don't want this final address to be too much about what has happened. I want to help you keep looking forward. To this end, let me begin by saying how confident I am in the leadership team that will take you through the vacancy. This is not a prime ministerial full confidence. <laughs> it is a genuinely held conviction. <laughs> Do uphold Bishop Sarah, who's uh, actually had to uh, drop out of today because her dog is seriously ill and she's having to watch over her. Uh, but do uphold Bishop Sarah in prayer in the months ahead. She will lead you with clarity, prayerfulness and love. We are served by three fabulous archdeacons in Libby, Rick and Bob, a wonderful diocesan secretary in James, a great new dean in Philip, a brilliant chair of finance in Mags, a wise equalities, diversity and inclusion lead in Remy, an inspiring DDE in Jill, a superb communications lead in Rod, and by an excellent transformation application lead in Duncan. They work well as a team. Uphold them in prayer. And have a little patience when some things might just take a little more time. I would also like you to remember the Bishop's Office team, Chris as chaplain, Joe as PA and office manager, Anne and Rachel, along with Sarah, who is Bishop Sarah's PA. They are superb, but the months ahead will pose fresh challenges for them too. They've never walked this way before. Pray too for the Vacancy and C Committee as they undertake their work of seeking, with the archbishops and others, the person who should be my successor. I know you will all play your part as consultations get underway sometime in the new year. I want to address now the issue of diocesan transformation. We have, over the past 10 years, first developed a diocesan strategy with our vision to bless our communities from the Tyne to the Tees and the Dales to the Sea in Jesus' name for the transformation of all. We initially had three priorities children and young people, growth and poverty. We also began to work with the National Church to support us financially in developing our first resource churches. We then moved on to develop communities of hope and the church planting strategy under the title of Cultivate. Halfway through, we took time to review where we had reached and what changes might be needed from our learning and discerning which culminated in the big conference here. This was the Waymark process. This room was where the children and young people did all their work. It led us to reaffirming the vision and the three priorities, but adding a fourth, which came from this room and the people in this room, that of care of God's creation. Since then, we have continued to develop the communities of hope, seen further resourcing churches develop and begun to see new church plants happening through Cultivate. However, the COVID pandemic hit our parishes hard, like everyone else in the region and the nation. It has been very difficult to help churches recover from the COVID impact on our lay leadership and numbers overall, particularly amongst the frailest elderly and the young. The biggest lesson learned from all of this I th is, I think, the need to recognise that we need to be willing to engage in transformation across every parish and church in the diocese. What this will look like will vary from place to place, even within the same benefice. 
However, the commonality is the need to focus deeply on every one of us being missionary disciples who invite others to become fellow pilgrims with us following Jesus together. They will in turn be inviting others to join in the pilgrim journey. And this will always be rooted in worship and prayer. Our chief end, after all, according to the Westminster Catechism, is to glorify God and enjoy God forever. So as we take the next steps in the whole diocesan transformation process, being worked on as a 10-year programme overall, all I can do at this stage is urge you to first keep looking up to God in worship, prayer and listening through the scriptures, our tradition, reason and learning from what God is doing amongst us. Then second, keep looking out to the world that God loves and which we are called to serve. Be outward facing, outward focused and outward serving. Then third, do attend to one another in prayerful pastoral support and encouragement of one another to keep walking with Christ, together continually growing in love for God, God's people and God's world. Be brave in planting new worshipping communities both using existing buildings and exploring taking risks at planting in new places, in schools, FE colleges, local community centres, care homes and out in the open air. Planting new places will both reach new people and build up the existing worshippers as God is seen to be active and alive across our diverse communities. And in this, do give a priority to the younger generations. That does not mean forgetting the older ones, but it is simply a question of where the priority is placed. Keep tackling poverty together with others, both in the practical expressions like food banks, warm spaces, lunch clubs, asylum seeker and refugee welcome, and in the whole business of seeking justice for the poorest and most vulnerable in our communities. In the latter, I believe a greater collaboration with Thailand and we as citizens would be valuable. Do all of this, attending to playing our part through our churchyards and community spaces in encouraging biodiversity, and working to move to net zero in all our very buildings. Keep being very clear that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Let us always work so that all creatures of our God and King will lift up their void parts and with us sing, O oh, praise God, O oh, praise God, Alleluia. I now want to move on to living in love and faith. For a large part of my 10 years in the Church of England has been going through the living in love and faith process. I'm sorry if I failed to lead this as well as I could within the diocese. I wish more parishes had engaged in the course and fed back into the process. Forgive me if I have failed to listen carefully enough to those who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex or asexual. I know you are not a category. Actually, I hate the LGBTQIA+. It makes people categories, not human beings. I know you're not. Each one is a person made in God's image for whom Jesus Christ died, just like every heterosexual person. The church has often hurt you and failed you badly. I'm deeply sorry for this, 
and for my own contribution to that hurt. For I am a frail, sinful person, so that I know that I will have done so, I hope always unwittingly. Equally, forgive me if you continue to uphold a traditional orthodox view on marriage and have a deep concern that your own position within the Church of England is under threat. I'm sure I have also not listened to you as well as I might have done. What I, working closely with Bishop Sarah, have been seeking to do is seek to be bishop to all the people of the diocese. This is, I am convinced, an important part of what it means to be a bishop of the diocese. The cure of souls is shared with all the clergy. The pastoral care is to be for all the people. Both those who worship with us regularly and the large majority who do not, but for whom I have been given a spiritual responsibility and authority by my consecration and office. The call to serve God by serving you all has been at the heart of my longing and actions. This is the Episcopal view of a diocesan bishop in the Church of England. Always serving all. And it can never be diminished from that. At the General Synod this week, A motion was passed that encourages the House of Bishops to continue its work of implementation following on from the decisions made in February. This will mean the commending of prayers of love and faith for use in parishes, but only where the incumbent and PCC agree that they will opt in to use them. It also encourages the bishops to look again at the use of services for an experimental period. This motion was passed only narrowly in both the House of Laity, 105 to 100, and the House of Clergy, 100 to 93. Unsurprisingly, there was a larger percentage in the House of Bishops in favour, 23 to 10. However, it is also worth remembering that the looking again at services had earlier only been passed by the laity with a majority of one, and there were two abstentions. And only by a majority of seven in the House of Clergy. Now, if you came to an archdeacon, or Bishop Sarah or I, after a particularly contentious issue, seeking advice, because a proposal had only been approved by one vote at a PCC meeting or an annual parochial meeting, I think we would all be advising you to proceed with great care and caution, not simply race ahead to crack on with the decision being implemented. So whilst the decision should not be blocked, in the short term, great care needs to be taken We were encouraged a lot as bishops to be more transparent in our workings. So let me be transparent with you. I could not vote in favour of the experimental services at this stage, and so I could not support the main motion as it had been amended when it came to the final vote. In other words, I was one of the ten. However, My note about taking great care about how to proceed when a matter is so finely balanced would apply if I had voted in favour, as this is about wise leadership and governance, not simply the rights or wrongs of a decision. We will have to see what steps the House of Bishops make and when. I remind you that Bishop Sarah and I have set up two evenings on December the 13th and the 14th. The 13th is at St Nick's in Durham and the 14th in Cuthbert House for people to come and talk with us about these matters. 
This leads me to also ask all clergy and PCCs to act with prayerful, thoughtful caution. There are those calling for rapid alternative options to be taken. And there are those who want to simply crack on with using the prayers and services. I would encourage everyone to consider carefully their actions. In particular, I would encourage us all to reflect afresh on how St Paul urged the Christians in Rome to treat one another over their strong and deep differences over food in Romans 14. Of course, it is not the same, but it bears prayerful reflection. I encourage us all to consider how all our churches offer welcome to all who choose to come and join us. I encourage us to think carefully about how we speak to and of one another. Let us always seek to ensure that, as Paul said to the Christians in Colossae, that our speech is always gracious, seasoned with salt, so that we may not, might know how we ought to answer each person. In the coming months, we will have to work through just how any further decisions from the House of Bishops are worked through in the diocese. Pray for wisdom in that decision making. I now want to turn to the theme of poverty. One of the reasons I know that I've struggled with working out how much time to give to living in love and faith has been my conviction that actually for the majority of our churches it has not been at the top of priorities. There has been much more concern about declining numbers and about the challenge of the poverty found amongst so many in our communities. Indeed, one, person, uh, one clergy person in the diocese very early on said to me, Bishop, you know, I am in favour of significant change in how the, the church handles this, but please don't let that consume this diocese, keep focusing on poverty. I heeded their advice. There's also been a desire to ensure good welcome to refugees and asylum seekers. So part of why I've focused on these issues locally and nationally has been because it has felt like these are the higher priorities in most parishes. And likewise, our relationship with Lesotho, that of some parishes with Kilimatindi, others with Sudan, and the growing number engaging with Burundi, has meant that their experience of the impact of climate change and the even deeper challenge they face with poverty means that this has been more of our global concern. You might tell me I got the balance wrong, but I don't think I got the priorities wrong. Another factor actually has been my co-chairing of the Archbishop's Commission on Families and Households. This has been one of the greatest privileges of my Episcopal life. The commissioners were a wonderful group of people with whom to work. The work we saw and learned about around the country with families was awe-inspiring. Our call was to address all family life in England, and this we sought to do. The response of our Love Matters report has received the, the, the response our Love Matters report has received from across churches, other faiths, and the whole children and family sector has been enormously positive. I'm convinced that in every parish, we can serve families well by simply doing some basics well. Our schools can serve families well by offering high quality relationships, education rooted in our Christian commitment to love and family life. I hope this will be taken forward across the diocese simply in reaching out to families of all sorts to keep on loving one another after the example of Jesus himself, but more later this afternoon. Now, I turn to Ukraine and Israel, Palestine and Gaza. Mentioning some of our global connections, I cannot end this address without reference to both the ongoing war in Ukraine and the horrific events in Israel and Gaza. It now feels that the Ukraine war is grinding on. Winter will mean more of a pause again, but not a cessation. Next spring will probably see renewed intensity. 
It is essential, I think, that our government continues to support Ukraine in defending itself and ensures that all the Ukrainians who fled here and were welcomed well continue to be assured that they are welcome to stay as long as it is necessary until it is safe for them and their children to return to their beloved homeland and homes. In relation to Gaza and Israel, there is no doubt that the terrorist killings and hijackings undertaken by Hamas on October the 7th were horrific and utterly wrong. Israel rightly wants to see the hostages released and returned to their families. And Israel rightly wants to defend itself and ensure Hamas can never undertake such outrageous killings again. However, like most people, I have watched the destruction of so much of Gaza with deep shock. The number of children and innocent civilians who have died is appalling. The failure to allow adequate humanitarian support in is deeply mistaken. There does need to be more than short-term humanitarian pauses, and the quantity of daily supplies being delivered clearly needs to increase significantly. Surely now a ceasefire to allow those in hospitals who are there for treatment or simply safety needs to be given adequate time to move. To safety. The hostages need to be released. Israel needs to ponder carefully what they will do to ensure that the Palestinians of Gaza and the West Bank are able to live in a true, just and lasting peace beyond this current period. This will have to include the rebuilding of homes and infrastructure. We must keep praying that the violence will end soon and we must hold on to hope for the future. And in our own nation, anti-Semitism needs to stop, as does Islamophobia. Both are pernicious evils. We need to stand alongside both our Jewish and Muslim friends and ensure they know they are fully equal citizens of our land. As I draw to a conclusion, I want to return to this beautiful diocese. Rosemary and I came here not really knowing the people and the places. And as Rosemary points out, she'd never been inside Durham Cathedral to the day of the announcement. We came with a deep sense that we were responding to God's call through God's church. It was a surprise and it was not an easy move to make. It has never ceased to be challenging. It has always also been deeply rewarding and an immense privilege. You have been wonderful people with whom to walk together as pilgrims. The communities across this diocese are amazing. Our congregations are led by wonderful clergy working with retired colleagues, church wardens, PCCs, licensed lay ministers, and a huge number of other volunteers. As Rosemary and I move away to Newark on Trent, we will carry you in our hearts. And please be assured, we will continue to hold you in our prayers. Thank you for helping me be your bishop. You have helped me grow as a pilgrim and follower of Jesus. For at the end of the day, all I have ever really wanted to do, since the day I found that God had hold of me in his loving arms, is to be a faithful follower of Jesus, the Lord and Saviour of the world. Thank you.